This is when the full divide between the Jews and the Samaritans took place. It is with those centers of opposition and incidents behind their people that we can understand the surprise of the Samaritan woman as read, will be read in John chapter 4, verse 9. When Jesus rises above the social and religious restrictions not just of a man talking to a woman, but also of a Jew talking to a Samaritan. As stated in John chapter 4, verse 6, it was about the six hours. That's around noon, the middle of the day. In John chapter 11, verse 9, Jesus answered, Are there not 12 hours in the day? Mm -hmm. You see, the calculation of time began at sunrise for the day and at sunset for the night. The day was divided into 12 equal parts and the night was divided into 12 equal parts. Each part represented an hour. They didn't have watches back then. An hour in the summer would have more than 60 minutes during the day. That's because the days were longer than the nights. An hour into winter would have less than 60 minutes during the day. And that's because the days were shorter than the night. So here it was about noon. Jesus was at the well, Jacob's well. In John chapter 4, verse 7, here comes a Samaritan woman. Why is she coming so late in the day? Most come early in the cool of the day. Well, she hopes to avoid the crowds. Mm -hmm. She is aware that the town people know of her lifestyle. She prefers not to deal with the looks and whispers. Mm -hmm. But on this particular day, Jesus is there. Jesus engages her in conversation. <coughs> he says unto her, give me to drink. In verse 9, then said the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it that thou, being a Jew, ask a drink of me, which I am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealing with the Samaritans. All right, we'll move on into testimony. John chapter 4, verse 10, Jesus asked and said unto her, If thou knew the gift of God, the goodness of God, and who it is that said to thee, give me to drink. If only you knew me and how much I want to be your savior, Amen. if you knew how much I love you, mm -hmm. thou wouldst have asked to me, and I would have given thee living water. Amen. The woman said unto him, Sir, I have nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? In other words, you don't have a line nor a bucket to lower down into the well. This well is very deep. You can't reach the water in it with your bare hands. So is there another well from whence you can get that living water for me? Verse 12 goes on to say, Our father Jacob gave us this well. He has drunk from it himself, along with his family and his livestock. Are you greater than he that you have bought your own well of water? Verse 13. Jesus answered and said unto her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. Listen to me. With this water, you will be coming to this well every day, because you will always be thirsty. No matter how often you come, no matter how much you draw, you will always be thirsty. Verse 14. For whosoever drinketh of the water that I give him shall never thirst. Amen. But the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. Amen. Let's unpack what we have heard so far. 
We have a woman. This means you and I. Comes to a well. The well represents the world. Mm -hmm. She comes because she's thirsty. This refers to all of our desires. She thinks the well, which is the world, <coughs> will satisfy her, but it will not. It can't. For no sooner does she have a drink, she is on her way to being thirsty again. Mm -hmm. And thus the well, which is the world, can only provide momentary <coughs> pleasure, but no lasting pleasure. You have a job, but you steal from your boss because he isn't paying you enough. Mm -hmm. Or you have your own business, but because of your financial greed, you mistreat your clientele. Mm -hmm. You have a vehicle that you can't afford, but you want one that will impress your neighbor. Or you have a modest sized home, but it's not big enough, so you go into more debt. You have a girlfriend, but one is not enough. Or you have a wife, but you need a mistress on the side. Mm -hmm. Enough is never enough. Mm -hmm. Jesus is there waiting for her. He is also waiting for you and I, mm -hmm. who are filled <coughs> with many desires and questions. He says to her, everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. Mm -hmm. In this statement, he is telling us with clarity that it is a simple fact that our desires are infinite and unlimited. Therefore, a finite and a limited world cannot satisfy us. And in this, the Lord clarified our desires. Our desires are in fact infinite. We are never really satisfied. Therefore, our desires are not really about the world at all. They are ultimately pointing us to God, who alone is infinite, Amen. and who alone can truly satisfy our desires or fill the God-sized hole in our hearts. Amen. Amen. Yes, here is clarity. Only God can satisfy us. Amen. The world simply can't cut the deal. It is finite and limited. Meeting us at the well of the world where we come once again to draw from it, the Lord says, in effect, how is that working for you? Indeed, how foolish we are. Do we really think that a new job, a new relationship, the latest gadget, or even more money will somehow satisfy us? It will not. It cannot. An old song says as well, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. Mm -hmm. yeah. Everyone who drinks from this water will be thirsty again. So here's clarity about our <laughs> desires. First, they are infinite. Mm -hmm. Second, the well, which is the world, cannot fulfill our infinite desires because it is finite. Third, our desires are first about God who alone can satisfy us since he alone is infinite. Amen. And fourth, Jesus says he is the one. He is God who can give us living waters welling up to eternal life so that we will never thirst again. <clears throat> Verse 15 goes on to say, The woman said unto him, Sir, give me this water, that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Okay, Lord, thanks for the clarity. But now, along with the Samaritan woman, we want to say to you, give us this water so that we will not be thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw water. In other words, how do we unlock this blessing? Do we simply answer an altar call? 
Then we simply accept baptism? Do we simply say, I believe, now give me my blessing? Some of you may be even more cynical, saying, look, I've been doing this walk with Jesus for a while now, and I'm still thirsty. I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And thus the question, how do I unlock those blessings? How do I lay hold of this promise of Christ? The answer is twofold. Conversion and conversation. In verse 16, Jesus said unto her, Go, call thy husband and come hither. This starts the conversion process. When the Samaritan woman says, Give me this water, Jesus answered her by saying, Go, call your husband and come back. We're now moving into the treasure stage. Go, call your husband and come back. In other words, Jesus wants to give her this blessing, but first, there is an obstacle <laughs> that must be dealt with. Amen. Most of us know the story of the Samaritan woman. They know that she had five husbands and is now simply living with a man outside of marriage. Verse 17. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. Verse 18. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now have is not thy husband. In that says thou truth. Though we do not have all the details, this personal history speaks to us of her many sorrows sins, and struggles. Surely, there are issues of sexual sin. She's living together with a man outside of marriage. But there are many, number of other issues that must have accompanied her many marriages, such as low self-esteem, unforgiveness, no patience, poor communication. The list could go on and on. These struggles and sin must be dealt with before the living water can fully flow. She or her husband may have not been able to forgive one another for something that caused mistrust between them. She may not have been patient enough to let God guide her steps. She may have been told over and over again that she was no good and she believed it. And so the Lord says to the woman, Go, call your husband. What does the Lord have to say to you? What conversions are necessary in your life? What obstacles must be removed for the living waters to flow? Consider this. I have seven gold bricks to give you. You are holding the box, but it's full of sand. In order to make room for the gold, I must first help you to empty your box of sand. Mm -hmm. The sand must go in order to make way for the gold. So it is with us. Our sins must give way to make room for the living waters of God's grace. Amen. 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 Conversion is necessary and essential to the land hold of the promise of Christ. And therefore, the Lord's promise of living water is not mere magic. It's a promise that stands. But simply answering an altar call or thinking some routine declaration will be enough is just not realistic. There is more involved here than simply cleaning a house. Human beings are complicated. We have many moving parts. Our minds are working 24-7. Mm -hmm. Through conversion, we must increasingly turn to the Lord to allow Him to make way for this living water to dwell up in us. Mm -hmm. Let's move into the temple category. Verse 19. The woman said unto him, Sir, 
I perceive that thou art a prophet. I will follow the worship in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Verse 21. Jesus said unto her, Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship, ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. Jesus was telling her that they have so many gods to worship that they don't know who or what they're worshiping. We know what we worship. We worship the one and only true God, the creator of the universe. The Jews are commanded to spread the good news, the gospel, to everyone, everywhere, for the salvation of all people. Jesus had just revealed that he knew about her man and husband, as well as the fact that the current man she lived with was not her husband. This made her uncomfortable. So she attempted to divert his attention from her personal life to matters of religion. Jesus refused to be distracted from his lesson on true worship and from going to the heart of the matter. In verse 23, but the hour is coming, and now it is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeks such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. The overall lesson about worshiping the Lord in spirit and in truth is that the worship of God is not to be confined to a single geographical location or necessarily regulated by the temporary provisions of the Old Testament law. With the coming of Christ, the separation between the Jew and the Gentile was no longer relevant, nor was the centrality of the temple in worship. With the coming of Christ, all of God's children gained equal access to God through him. Amen. Worship became a matter of the heart, not external actions, and directed by truth rather than ceremony. Conversation is very important. The Lord goes on to have a rather lengthy conversation with the Samaritan woman. We don't have all the details, and many of them are none of our business. <laughs> Nevertheless, the conversation leads her step by step to greater joy and finally to the point that she is able to leave her water pot. Mm -hmm. This is a symbolic act, meaning that she now has access to living water. Mm -hmm. Amen. She no longer needs a container for water mm -hmm. which cannot quench her thirst. Right. She runs to town joyfully, telling others of the glorious Lord and Messiah she has met. Let's read these verses beginning with verse 25. We're now moving into the talent category. Verse 25. The woman said unto him, I know that the Messiah coming which is called Christ. When he has come, he will tell us all things. Jesus said unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. Amen. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman. Amen. Yet no man said, What seekest thou? Or why talkest thou with her? They kept their mouth shut. Mm -hmm. Verse 28. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and said to the men, 
Come, see a man who's told me all things that ever I did. Is not this the Christ? Of course, her conversation is a symbol for the longer conversation the Lord needs to have with us. Yeah. Conversation can be understood here as a kind of journey we make with the Lord, mm -hmm. who along the way enters into an even deeper dialogue with us through prayer and his presence in our life. There is for the Christian the summons to enter into an even deeper living and conscious contact with the Lord at every moment of our day. And not only in our prayer, but throughout our day in the people we meet. Verse 30 says, Then they went out of the city and came unto him. In verse 39, and many of the Samaritans of that city believed on him for the saying of the woman, which testified, he told me all that I ever did. Verse 40, so when the Samaritans were coming to him, they besought him that he would tarry with them, and he abode there two days. And many more believed because of his own word. Amen. And said unto the woman, Now we believe, not because of thy saying, for we have heard him ourselves, mm -hmm. and know that this is indeed the Christ, the Savior of the world. Amen. As you can see in these verses, many of the people she told about Jesus believed her, but many didn't. Mm -hmm. There were divers. But once the doubters got the opportunity to see and hear Jesus for themselves, they believed. And this is the way it is with us today. You can talk to some people until you're blue in the face, and they don't want to hear anything you have to say about Jesus. But as soon as they get knocked down in life, they start searching for Jesus the Christ. Our worship God is directed by our love for him. Amen. As we love, so we worship. Amen. To worship God in spirit and truth necessarily involves loving him with heart, soul, mind, and strength. Amen. True worship must be in spirit, that is, engaging the whole heart. Yes. Unless there is a real passion for God, there is no worship in spirit. Mm -hmm. At the same time, worship must be in truth. That is, properly informed. Yes. Unless we have knowledge of the God we worship, there is no worship in truth. Mm -hmm. Both are necessary for satisfying and God-honoring worship. Spirit without truth leads to a shallow, overly emotional experience that could be compared to a high. Mm -hmm. As soon as the emotion is over and the passion cools, so does the worship. Mm -hmm. Truth of the spirit can result in a dry, passionless encounter that can easily lead to a form of joyless legalism. The best combination of both aspects of worship results in a joyous appreciation of God informed by Scripture. Amen. The more we know about God, the more we appreciate Him. Yeah. The more we appreciate, the deeper our worship. Amen. The deeper our worship, the more God is glorified. Yeah. When we accept Christ, we become his stewards. We are called to manage God's possessions that we are entrusted with. We will have to give an account of our stewardship. In closing, 
I will briefly summarize the five T's of Christian stewardship. Time. Jesus will spend time with us if we are willing to spend time with him. Amen. The Samaritan woman went from being depressed to being overjoyed. Testimony. We have to give our testimony to as many as we can about the goodness of Christ. Amen. The Samaritan woman testified to a city of men. Some believed her right away, and others were curious enough to find out the truth for themselves. <coughs> treasure. The blessing of Christ is all the treasure we need. The Samaritan woman was blessed by the conversation she had with Jesus. She can now hold her head up high. Her guilt has been lifted. <laughs> Temple. We worship in an earthly built structure, but we are the temple of God. Yes. Jesus told the Samaritan woman not to worry about where else she worshiped, but to worship the true God in spirit and in truth. Yes. And tell her, the most important talent that anyone can have is to accept Jesus Christ as his Lord and Savior and to worship him in spirit and in truth. The Samaritan woman accepted Christ. She told many about her conversation and her conversion. She now has a brighter future. Amen. Remember, we all have a past. But let us make sure that our future is bright in the eyes of our Heavenly Father. Amen. Amen. The contemporary version of the Bible states in 2 Peter verse 3, 9, this way, it says, The Lord isn't slow about keeping his promises, as some people think he is. In fact, God is patient because he wants everyone to turn from sin and no one to be lost. Amen. In Ezekiel chapter 33, verse 11, the Lord says, I have no pleasure in the death of the weak, but that the wicked turn from his way and live. John 3, 16 says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, have everlasting life. Amen. John 3 17 goes on to say, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Amen. He didn't con condemn this emergent woman, nor will he condemn us if we repent of our sins. God has entrusted us. With his possessions, let us be good stewards of them. Give God your best, and in return, you will be blessed. Thank you, and God bless. Amen. Amen.